Hello, welcome to season one of our Generative AI series. I'm Oprah here, your host for the season. Generative AI is just not a trend or a buzzword. It is here to stay. Alan Turing thought about a thinking machine 75 years back during World War II. He tragically died at the age of 41. But his legacy continues. In our upcoming episodes in this season, we'll cover various facets of generative AI, like technical architectures behind the scene, the GPU stack, the growth of unicorns, investment patterns, and role of government in implementing compliances and regulations on generative AI to keep it safe for all of us. In today's episode, we'll cover the history of generative AI itself. I have my very good friend, Peter Tioni today. He is a serial CTO and a technologist. Welcome, Peter. Yeah, thank you, Aparo, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very passionate about collaborative tools, technologies. That's my field. Thank you for joining in, Peter. So let's begin with to know if generative AI is even new. How did it start? and how has it traversed so far? Simply put, uh, generative AI is, or are basically machines that start to think. Uh, so in the early days of uh, AI, it was mainly about analyzing and tabulating data. So something like two plus two equals something. So meaning not generating new content. Now with generative AI, uh, those systems actually generate new content that's not just A plus B. Now, uh, to your first question is, is AI new? Uh, actually, it's pretty old. So um, it has been a long, around for quite a long time. And I would say even it started with Alan Turing. But before we go into these details, just first like the steps of AI uh, that we have by time. So in the 50s, so 1950s to 60s, so there was the Turing theory and the very early AI uh, development. Then in the 80s and 90s, uh, the neural networks uh, came on board. And uh, so the first time that the machine could learn. And in the 2000, uh, the first gener generative AI models uh, started. They're called RBMs and uh, DBNs. 2014, uh, the special type of generative AI was introduced called the generative adversarial AI or network. So that's GAN, GANS. Mm. So then in 2017, uh, a new type of, uh, of generative AI uh, started with a model called transformers. And that was really a breakthrough in AI. And we will go into detail uh, in that in a bit. And then in the 2020s, so multi-models emerged where um, the AI would understand multiple types of input, not just text, but also images and audio and video, and also can produce uh, multiple uh, types of content as well, not just text. <coughs> Peter, the history itself is so intriguing. So can you uh, walk us a little deeper? Okay, so um, it all started with Alan Turing. And uh, he was really influential in the compute world. Uh, one of actually his key contributions was to shorten World War II. <laughs> so the Germans had a encryption machine uh, called Enigma. And uh, Alan Turing was uh, helped actually break that uh, Nazi's um, code machine called Enigma. So that was really influential. He also uh, had a thought experiment. He called it the Turing machine, or it was later called the Turing machine after his last name. So basically uh, a device that manipulates symbols and uh, strip of uh, tape uh, according to uh, like a, a rules table. And that's basically the foundation of the computing that we have today. 
he also had a thought experiment. Uh, will machine at some point be intelligent enough that you can't tell if it is a machine or a human uh, responding to a, like a conversation. So actually he called it initially the imitation game. So he basically envisioned that uh, computers could be programmed. And that was like really a breakthrough, right? So now we have all the computers, it's all, all about uh, programming computer, making sense of uh, some input producing output, right? And he called it the ACE, so automatic compute engine. Based on, it, on his ideas, later on in the 40s and 50s, uh, researchers like Norbert Wiener and uh, John van Neumann uh, had basically defined the first concept of artificial intelligence. It's basically uh, thinking, hey, how does the human brain work? And is there a way that we can replicate that with a machine? It wasn't uh, there yet, so it was just more or less a thought experiment. So then in from the 50s through the 70s, we had this so-called symbolic AI. Mm -hmm. So that's where an AI uh, could make sense of input based on some rules. And one famous machine, uh, well, a rule-based machine was called ELISA. That was uh, created in 1964. It's basically a program that uh, uh, simulated a therapist. So basically through uh, AI, or in that, ti that time it was called uh, NLP, Natural Language Processing, based on some rules, you would ask uh, Eliza a question, it would go through this rules table and come up with the most uh, plausible answer, right? So that was Eliza. That already uh, surprised some people. Hey, wow, <laughs> it's really possible that a machine uh, can produce content uh, that sounds like a human. Um, but they were still uh, quite uh, limited and that's basically because it had to be manually programmed with these rules. These rules tables be become bigger and bigger, more complex, but it still couldn't, it couldn't replicate how a human brain worked. So then, next uh, phase in the 80s and 90s, we come into neural networks with uh, so-called back propagation. So um, that's again uh, basically simulating how a human brain works. And here, uh, the main persons behind this was Geoffrey Hinton, David Rummelhart, and uh, Ronald Williams. They, uh, they popularized or defined the backpropagation. Backpropagation basically means a neural network that can learn, or in simple terms, uh, like learn from uh, some weight. A neural network, uh, you could think of, you have some input up here, one layer of uh, AI, of a neural network. It uh, adjusts some values, then there's a second layer, the second layer gets input from the first layer, and there's some weight uh, to decide which way to go. And then there's third layer, so, so it's multiple layers. And on each layer, there is like a weight uh, that defines uh, if to go from the first layer to the second, next, uh, ne uh, this next layer, this way or that way, um, that's defined by a weight. And with the back pro propagation, uh, it's basically a training model where the model could kind of a feedback loop to uh, tweak uh, those uh, weights. And that way uh, the machine could uh, be trained to produce some output uh, uh, that made sense. And uh, these were, could be, could be, these systems already could be used for machine translation. So it was already pretty useful. Next steps uh, is in the 2000s. That's we get into the so-called deep learning and also the early generative models. So um, the deep learning started in the 2000s and uh, 
that was mainly marked by a shift from uh, just uh, training in general to a data-driven approach. And uh, in that time, uh, so-called RBM, so that's a restricted Boltzmann machine, and also a, DN, a DBN, that's a deep belief network. So those emerged as the uh, first versions of these generative models. So they could now for the first time generate new content or new patterns uh, based on some input. So that's now truly uh, new content that has been created, that can be created. Now in uh, 2006, uh, Geoffrey Hinton and his co colleagues popularized the concept of deep learning. And that's basically the groundwork for these generative models that will arrive after that. Now, um, the first step uh, of these generative uh, models is the so-called Generative Adversial Network, or GAN, that was in 2014. The idea there is that you have uh, two AIs, relatively simple. So the first AI, um, you have some input, it generates a response, and then you have a second AI that takes that response and uh, determines does it make sense? Does this answer make sense based on that input? And then uh, based on that response of the second AI, the first AI could be tweaked or uh, so made better. So that's how the, the, the first uh, AI um, can be uh, made better, uh, can be trained better with the feedback from the second AI. So that's the idea of the gun. Um, so that worked well again, but it wasn't uh, generally enough yet. So Peter, what happened after the GANs model? Why was the concept of transformers were even introduced? Okay, so the next breakthrough after GAN came with the so-called transformer model. And that was really a breakthrough idea. And that was first introduced by a paper by published by Google employees, by Vaswani and etc. And the paper was called, or is called, Attention is All You Need. And there they proposed a model based on a transformer. And uh, the key idea with introducing this transformer is now you can parallelize uh, the training uh, much better. So with the earlier models, it was more or less sequential. So you couldn't really work with a huge amount of data. Now, with the transformer model, it was the first time it's possible to throw at a huge amount of data, and it wasn't processed sequentially, but by it could be just paralyzed by many, many computers uh, uh, in a network. And the, nowadays, the transformer model is used by the majority of the generative AI models that we know of today, such as uh, GPT, which stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer, uh, that's done by a company called OpenAI. And uh, there is also uh, Claude by Anthropic. There is Perplexity. Uh, there are many uh, different AI models and they all use this uh, transformer model. Um, based on this transformer idea uh, in the 2020s, um, it get more and more uh, powerful. So initially, uh, these models were just understanding text input and were producing text output. So then they became uh, aware like multimodal or a model. So that means they could understand not just text, but you also could throw at it an image. You could uh, uh, throw at it uh, some audio, meaning music, even videos. And then it would produce also content that's not just text, but also annotated by images, uh, etc. Um, there are AIs that are uh, mainly tailored to chat, so that's the chat GPT, for example, that's, uh, that sits on top of the GPT uh, AI uh, system. And uh, for images, there is DAL-E um, and uh, there are other ones as well. For music generation, uh, there is mu 
MuseNet, uh, JukeDeck, and other uh, trained models as well. Um, so there are different models uh, that uh, take use of this uh, generative AI based on transformers. Nowadays, uh, meaning 2020 and uh, going on, um, we see really a quick uh, progression of the technology. So each of these makers, uh, they produce a new model, maybe once every half a year or so, and, and each new model is uh, quite advanced, way more advanced than the previous one. So it's actually quite amazing how uh, good these tools became. Uh, so if we look at the, if you, if you look at Google Translate, uh, many people you are familiar with the Google Translate, right? Just maybe five years ago, uh, uh, I speak also Japanese, for example. So if I would translate some text into Japanese and read the Japanese text, uh, it didn't sound right, right? So, uh, but nowadays, uh, it's actually just amazing how well the translation works. So with each iteration, uh, of these generative AI models, uh, there's a big step forward. In my field, uh, meaning mainly making uh, engineering organizations more productive using collaborative tools and AI tools, I see just an amazing progress. So just, yeah, five years ago, it was unthinkable that an AI could assist me in uh, coding or programming, right? Nowadays, I use it every day. <laughs> it's basically a given. The, the boring stuff, the mundane task, I just hand over to an AI, right? If I'm not f familiar with some coding tasks or with a particular language, I let the AI handle that, right? So it's a huge productivity boost. Absolutely, Gen AI play a vital role in programmers' life today. With that, we end our episode now. In our upcoming episode, we'll cover the technical architecture of a transformer model, which play a vital role in Gen AI landscape. Stay tuned, see you.